Hello everyone, my name is Phoenix Ablaze. Welcome to the Tiki Oasis monthly series focusing on subjects of history, appropriation versus appreciation of cultures, minority cultures, tiki culture, and mid-century Americana. The goal of this series is to provide a forum for education, knowledge, and conversation. Through this series, we invite marginalized groups to amplify their voices, to share their knowledge, knowledge and experiences. We invite advocates and allies to ask questions, and we invite all to contribute to the broader discussion on diversity, inclusion, representation, and equality in the Tiki community. As we dive into our monthly series, there are many topics to unpack, discuss, and understand that are part of the current Tiki culture. To introduce our guest for this month, we have invited Ms. Tiki Oasis 2017, Di Lovely. San Diego's homegrown Tiki Queen is proud to be the first woman of color to win the Miss Tiki Oasis title. Di Lovely grew up as a Polynesian dancer performing for private events at the Bali High and the former Hanalei Hotel. She continued to perform at the competitive level with local dance troops, but you may best recognize her as the Tiki Oasis Symposium Instructor for the Beginners Hula Dance Class. Di Lovely had quickly become a sought after burlesque artist, headlining festivals and teaching across North America to as far as the Philippines and Australia. She has also been the only San Diegan to compete multiple times at the International Burlesque Hall of Fame. This proud Pina strives to bring visibility to the Philippinex performers as she curates the Burlesque Last Philippinex show in which the event has garnered much attention with an entertainment cover feature in the LA Times and several podcasts, including, including the Desert Oasis Room. Here is Miss Di Lovely. Hi. Hi, Di. <laughs> so good seeing you. How are you? Long time I, no see. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for, for being here today. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. You know, this is a really special topic. And of course, it hits close to home being Filipino American. And Adrian is such a great resource to have. And I'm excited for all the information he's going to share with us today. Same. Well, I'll let you get to it. Okay. So for our topic this month, Tiki Oasis has invited Adrian Eustachio to share with us the original Filipino bartenders of Don the Beachcomber and how they contributed to and influenced tropical drinks in the early days of Polynesian pop. Throughout the conversation, please put your questions in the chat or Q&A section. Also, please note that this talk today is benefiting Adrian's Desert Oasis Room and his podcast to bring you more presentations related to Polynesian pop culture. And if you appreciate his presentation today, please consider donate, donating at desertoasisroom.com slash donate. Adrian Eustachio is a longtime Tiki enthusiast, active member in the Tiki community, and avid supporter of the current Tiki revival. Considered as one of the major influencers of the Tiki scene, Adrian began collecting Tiki, Hawaiian, and South Pacific ephemera almost three decades ago and has been studying the mainland Tiki movement and its relation to American pop culture and cocktail culture, both currently and historically. Adrian is also the host and executive producer of Inside the Desert Oasis Room, a podcast recorded from his home Tiki space of the same name. And the Inside the Desert Oasis Room podcast eavesdrops on simulating and entertaining conversations with various artists, entertainers, mixologists, collectors, historians, enthusiasts, and more, while enjoying a round or two of tropical cocktails. On occasion, the podcast makes a field trip to record on location at other equally themed home spaces, bars, or live events. And I'm proud to introduce Adrian Yasakio. Aloha. Good morning. Aloha. What's up, buddy? And mabuhay. <laughs> uh, mabuhay. No, we, are, we are sequestered to our, uh, our private spaces at the moment, and I miss everybody. So, And I miss you. I miss seeing you in person. I know. Yeah, we, we met a couple years back at, yeah. Um, yeah, 2017. I mean, of course, we, we've been around for a while, but um, yeah. just because 
you know, when you won um, the best room party, right? Right. right. <laughs> that, that year. And then I won the title. We're like, yeah, Filipino. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Filipino pride. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fun. That was uh, Tiki Oasis. What was that? Was that 2017? 2017, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was fun. I'm excited to present some history about our our Filipino forefathers, our countrymen that helped put this genre and subculture, uh, for lack of a better term, like this, this thing that we enjoy mm-hmm. every day. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm still learning, you know, there's, there's so much information out there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, mean, I think we're very lucky to have you today. Thank you, I and, appreciate the um, yeah, and um, I just want to, you know, really encourage viewers to subscribe to your podcast because you have you. a lot Thank of amazing guests with so much information. Thank you. And um, and it's a lot of fun too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, kind of, you kind of feel like you're in the room with them and just having your own cocktail and yeah. just having a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks. Anyway, yeah. so I'll I'll just let you get to it. Okay. Okay, so yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Let me let me uh, share my screen. All righty, here we go. Well, let me start by saying welcome to everybody out there who joined us on today's session. Aloha and mabuhai. Mabuhai is our word for aloha in the Philippine language. And so welcome and thank you. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a little bit about me. I've, I've been an avid collector of tiki and Hawaiiana for the better part of three decades. Uh, started in somewhere in the early 90s, not knowing that I was collecting when I was just buying the things that I enjoyed. Um, and through that, and through that particular process, I started learning about what what is this whole tiki thing? Um, Is is that being a historian, uh, I don't know, lack of a better term, again, historian, enthusiast, I I love studying studying the genre. Uh, As an urban archaeologist, I love seeing what's still out there, seeing what uh, what is in place of what used to be out there. Um, I am an amateur mixologist. I've never worked in a bar, but I enjoy that part of the culture as well as we do make drinks here in the Desert Oasis room when we record podcasts and uh, try to act as a responsible uh, subculture and cultural ambassador to both uh, Tiki and the Polynesian pop movement. Um, I've been published in a few things. So uh, Imbibe Magazine, Tiki Magazine, Hanahu Magazine, uh, been in a few uh, articles and documentaries uh, presented a couple of years ago at uh, Comic-Con in San Diego. And, uh, and I, uh, I am the uh, founder and principal of Desert Oasis Media. What, what I do is basically produce content for the web. Um, that is uh, my way of documenting my research. So documenting my research instead of writing a book, I'm basically doing that in a digital format through podcast interviews, uh, vlogging events, and, uh, and things uh, similar to that, like urban archaeology, for example. So... Let's start with talking about the history and of Tiki and the Tiki Bar. Uh, I think that this is something that um, just a kind of a quick rundown of what it is to get you to understand how the Filipino bartender came to be. So basically, uh, this is um, a product of prohibition, right? So prohibition was um, this thing that happened in the United States that they call the Great Experiment. Uh, they thought that alcohol was co- causing all of the social ills uh, in society, uh, people that were jobless, uh, people that were, uh, uh, you know, uh, lazy, or, or maybe people had uh, social issues. Uh, uh, they thought that alcohol, but by banning alcohol, it would solve some of those problems. And so they, they went into a period of prohibition. That started in January 28th, 1919. At that time, American spirits were completely affected. So whiskey, bourbon, all the things that were distilled here in mainland America were shut down. Um, In so doing, people that still wanted to have their alcohol were producing 
their own spirits illegally in the form of moonshine. Over the years, people started, uh, they, they, they started opening these like illegal secret societies, secret bars called speakeasies. The term speakeasy is uh, basically, it's, it's, it's to whisper that uh, so-and-so, uh, there's a bar over here. Uh, if you go at this time and you knock on the door and you, you say certain thing or whatever, you can get in. These are secret drinking clubs. Um, foreign spirits were not affected by uh, prohibition. Production of rum, vodka, all that stuff was produced overseas. And so they weren't really affected by prohibition the way that American-based uh, spirits were. And when prohibition was lifted on December 5th, uh, that is, aka, it looks like I missed that one, it's called Repeal Day. Um, when bars started opening, rum was chosen by our favorite guy, Don the Beachcomber. And the reason why rum was chosen was because since it was produced overseas, it was not affected by production and it was cheap to obtain because, uh, you know, if you were going to be uh, trying to get whiskey or, or anything like that, a lot of those distilleries had to retool and there was a cost to that. Rum was readily available and it was cheap. So Don the Beachcomber, who is Don the Beachcomber? His real name or birth name was er Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant. And he was a former bootlegger during that time of prohibition. And he was an eccentric person. He did a lot of traveling, traveled the South Pacific, and he opened Don the Beachcomber on December 5th, 1933, on repeal day. Started at 1722 North McCadden Place in a hotel lobby, or in the corner of a hotel lobby. And a few years later in 1937 is when he actually opened Don's Beachcomber Cafe across the street at 1727 North McCadden Place. If you go there today, it's just a giant apartment complex. Um, Don's cons largely considered the godfather of Tiki because he started this whole tropical escapist environment. Um, when I say here that he ushered in the concept of escapism, from based on our uh, research, he was the first guy to open that escapist tropical themed bar. Uh, prior to Don, we had 13, 14 years of prohibition and prior to that, I believe everything were saloons. So uh, Don was really the first guy to start that tropical themed escapist environment. Here's a couple of pictures from his Don's Beachcomber Cafe. He had this tagline, if you can't get to paradise, I'll bring it to you. And so what Don did was he decorated his space with a lot of the things that uh, he, he had collected in his travels when he was traveling the South Pacific and created this themed tropical environment. Okay, so this is a slide of some of his alumni. Don employed a lot of people from the Filipino community. Um, he was actually a champion of the community. He was somebody that always gave somebody a job. So if one of these folks came in and said, hey, Don, my brother needs a job. Do you think he can start in the kitchen? Or hey, can he uh, park cars or whatever it is? Don would give him a job. And so a lot of Filipinos ended up there because Filipinos are very family oriented. And if you look here, there are quite a few prominent names here, like Ray Buen, who started the Tiki Tea, Mariano Liquidini, who uh, started the bar program at the Maikai, um, Dick Santiago, Hank Riddle, Leon Lontok, Ray Barrientos, Conrad Lacerna, Tony Ramos. Uh, Tony Ramos, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about him uh, in a few minutes. Um, but just to give you an example, of uh, how Don championed the community, the Filipino community. Dick Santiago, for example, was dating a white woman and they wanted to get married and interracial marriage was illegal in California at the time. So Don helped him transfer to his Hawaii location so that he can marry his, his, uh, his partner there because at the time Hawaii was in a state and it was not illegal to have interracial marriage. Um, so there's a lot of names here. 
I, I, I'm not going to go through and talk about each person just, just for the sake of time. And also because I don't have a lot of information on each person, but I also want to, before we go any further, I, I want to also point out that not all Filipino bartenders were at Don's. Uh, you had Bob Ismino, for example, he was a manager at the Contiki and he and his brothers managed Contiki locations all at different times and all different locations. Um, there's also Bobby Batugo, who doesn't really get a lot of attention, uh, but he was also from that era. And uh, he started out the key club. He ended up being the main guy at Tips Restaurant, and he's a three-time USBG cocktail champion. He's the only three-time USBG champion. And then there's also the Kabang family, who uh, opened the Royal Hawaiian here in Southern California in 1947. Something that I want to point out here is the Kabang family, when they opened the, the Royal Hawaiian, they opened it up as a family, ran it as a family. You look at Bob Ismino and his brothers, they were managing various Contiki uh, locations. And if I go back to the previous slide, we look at uh, Ray Buen, who founded the Tiki Tea. He went back and uh, when he started running that bar. He ran it with his wife and eventually passed it down to his son and grandsons. Mario Liquidini, when he was working at the Maikai, he'd have his son come in on, on the weekend and, and help him make syrups. So um, very family oriented. So I want to highlight just a few of the main guys that you're uh, probably most familiar with. Ray Buen is one of them. Um, he immigrated from the Philippines in the 1920s. And his birth name is Ray Buhion. A lot of people don't know that. The reason why his name is Ray Buen today is he changed it to help himself assimilate to uh, mainland United States. Ray worked everywhere that was Tiki. He started out at Don the Beachcomber in Hollywood. As a matter of fact, he was one of Don's original four Filipino bartenders. They called him the four Filipinos. Um, from there, he worked at uh, other spots, including the Luau, the Seven Seas, the China Trader, Palms in the Jungle, as well as Christian's Hut, which is pictured here on the left. Christian's Hut was a bar that was built by Clark Gable on the set of Mutiny on the Bounty. And he sent Ray out there and had him bartend for the duration of that uh, filming. So Ray was out there. Uh, bartending for the crew at the end of a, a day's worth of work. And eventually they moved that bar to Newport Beach, incorporated the goof as a part of their decor. And the goof is, sits on top of the Bally High in San Diego today on the roof. Um, some of the things that Ray is known for is at one time he was working at the Dresden in Hollywood. He retooled the Blood and Sand, uh, which was named uh, after a drink uh, after a, time, a, a, a movie that uh, Tyrone Powers was starring in. And um, he was a very popular bartender. Ray had built a fan base that followed him from bar to bar. Um, that's something that it happens today. I, I don't know how common that was then, but today there are people that follow their favorite bartenders from bar to bar. And that's something that Ray was doing in the early 20th century. Uh, he eventually founded the Tiki Tea, which translates into the God of Drink. And through what he practiced at Don's, he continued practicing that, that lost art of tropical mixology all the way into the 80s and 90s. And why is that significant? Because the 80s was labeled the decade of destruction. In the world of Tiki, that was when tastes changed and bars are being torn, torn down left and right. Um, and, you know, it's a lot of bars uh, in order to survive dropped that practice of secret syrups and uh, top end ingredients and um, that, that art of the craft cocktail, the, the, the crafted tropical cocktail, because it had to survive. But at the Tiki Tea, Ray continued to practice that because that's that that was his ethos. That's what he he learned at Don the Beachcomber. Okay, so this is one of the things that I wanted to point out with Ray. If you look at their most popular drinks, 
the Bayanihan, the Chief Lapu Lapu, the Raised Mistake that was based on the Anting Anting. These are all drinks that are named with the Filipino language. So the Bayanihan, um, here they define it as uh, togetherness or, or to be together. Um, that is kind of a loose definition. Um, there is also, uh, you know, when you're moving, when you're moving house or, or, or helping family, uh, that's also uh, another way to define by a Nihan. Uh, Chief Lapu Lapu, Chief Lapu Lapu is uh, the, the first Filipino war hero. He's revered in the Philippines because he defeated Magellan when, when Magellan tried to come in and, and conquer the Philippines. Um, and Ray's mistake is named after uh, Ray himself when he poured the wrong syrups into an anting anting. The anting anting is uh, is the name for uh, for an amulet, um, and uh, again loosely defined, just like aloha has different. It can mean different things. It can also mean um, potion, um, and in this case, they use that that name anting anting as witch's brew. If you look at this photo, uh, you'll see Ray at the bottom left here. Something fun about what he used to do at the Tiki T is if you look at that sign on the wall, it says Tiki T left-handers luau. And something that he used to do there is what's called the left-handers club. If you opted to participate in the left-handers club, basically uh, you had to drink all of your drinks with your non-dominant hand. And if you got caught using your dominant hand, you had to put a little bit of change in a little uh, coin jar. And at the end of the year, Ray would have a left-handers luau for everybody that participated. Uh, he would use the money from that coin jar. And that's what you're seeing in that sign there. Um, later on, I'm gonna be loading some footage from a left-handers luau I have. I've been, I've been holding it for a while and I've been saving it for the 60th anniversary of the Tiki T, which will be happening this April. So. Uh, watch out for that. I think you'll enjoy that. But the main thing here also that I wanted to point out is by passing down this bar to his son and grandson, who are Mike Sr. and Mike Jr. on the photo on the right, he's following that tradition that a lot of the Filipino bartenders did where they incorporated their passion and what they did, shared their secrets with their, their family and their families only. Uh, this is something that I want to share with you guys that this was pointed out by a friend of mine, Boris Hamilton. If you look at Don the Beachcomber on the upper left, that was Don's Beachcomber Cafe. And you've looked at the way the bar was laid out. And then you looked at Don the Beachcomber on the right, uh, upper right, which is the Don the Beachcomber Chicago, Illinois location. You look at the way the bar is laid out. And then you look at the Tiki T down below and you look at the way the bar is laid out. <laughs> It's really interesting how you have the L-shaped bar on the left with the tables on the right. Um, Don the Beachcomber in Hollywood was where Ray Buen got his start. Don the Beachcomber in Chicago is Mar where Mariano Liquidini got his start. And if you look at the Tiki T, it's laid out very much the same. I thought that was kind of interesting. So let's talk about Mariano. So. Mariano is the guy that came from Don the Beachcomber in Chicago and opened up uh, the bar at the Mai Kai. He was brought in to create their drink program and he created 48 original drinks when he came to the Mai Kai. Uh, he started out at the Don the Beachcomber in Hollywood for a, a brief stint before he went to Chicago. And before the Mai Kai, he was at Don's for 16 years. So he's a seasoned veteran at this point. And when he got down to the Mai Kai, if you look at that first bullet on the right-hand column, you'll see that he also continued the lost art of tropical mixology. Again, through the lean decades, the Mai Kai, not, not Mariano himself. Mariano passed away in uh, 1980, I believe, at the age of 73. But he handed down a legacy that... They uh, practiced the art of the tropical mixology with the secret syrups, but they took it a step farther and they were doing it where, behind closed doors and literally behind closed doors. So what they were doing is they were creating these drinks uh, out of sight from 
what could possibly be uh, competitors coming in and seeing how they're making their drinks. Because back at that time, you had other bars that were trying to poach their best, uh, their competitors' best bartenders. Uh, bartenders were uh, were a thing. Like a, again, if we go back to Ray Buen uh, having fans basically following him from bar to bar, a lot of the competitors took note of that and knew that hey, if we get this guy, he's going to bring his previous customers with him. Uh, in addition to the new customers that that, that they're going they're going to get anyway. So Mariano helped keep those drinks even more secret by doing it behind closed doors. And so when you ordered the drinks, they would come through a trap door. You couldn't see how they were made. Um, and Mariano did something that, again, is another practice that, that happens uh, today with many tropical bars. He would retool the drinks that he was making at Don the Beachcomber and improve them in his own way. And because the drink was different now, he would rename the drink. So the Cobra's Fang became a Cobra's Kiss. Dr. Funk became a Dr. Fong. Uh, the Vicious Virgin became the Impatient Virgin. Beachcomber's Gold became Liquid Gold and so on and so on. Uh, again, this is a practice that happens a lot today. Um, and, and I don't profess to be a, a, an expert on Mariano and the Mai Kai. I know what I know about him because, you know, his history does excite me. But the real experts here are our friends Tim Glasner and uh, Jim Hayward. They, they run Swankpad and Atomic Grog, swankpad.org and atomicgrog.com. As a matter of fact, Tim Glasner wrote a book on the Mai Kai. And uh, so if you want to learn more about Mariano and, and about uh, the Mai Kai and, and the legacy of that restaurant, uh, you can you can check out their websites and their Instagram pages and follow them. They're very active, especially Jim Hayward's Atomic Grog is very active with uh, uh, with all kinds of articles about that kind of stuff. And, and and Tim has a great book out right now. So just going back to what I mentioned before, this is a picture of the Molokai Bar, and if you look at the bar, there are no bottles, so there are no bartenders. When you order a drink at this bar you are not going to see a bartender pull bottles off the shelf and mix it in front of you on the counter. The order goes to the back where the bartenders make it behind this particular wall you are looking at. And they come out through a little trap door that's served to you by a cocktail waitress, keeping that lost art of secrecy alive. Okay, I wanna talk about Tony Ramos because Tony Ramos was a Don the Beachcomber bartender as well. He, uh, he bartended at the Don the Beachcomber, Beachcomber in Palm Springs, which today, if you go there today, is uh, the bootlegger tiki bar. He also bartended at the San Diego Don the Beachcomber, the China Trader in Burbank, the Luau, just like a lot of the Filipino bartenders. Um, and he, he cre he's credited with creating the Hawaiian Eye cocktail at the China Trader in 1963 when the cast of that television series would come in at the end of the day and sit at the bar and order drinks from him. Fast forward a couple of decades when this Polynesian pop movement started to basically die out and Tony Ramos was discovered bartending at the Madame Wu's and Jeff Berry and Sven Kirsten and a few of those folks, uh, they would sit at the bar and order the old Don the Beachcomber cocktails that Tony Ramos could still make for you while they listen to Exotica music on a boombox. I thought that was kind of a fun story. Mm -hmm. I put Ciudad in there because that, that there's something significant about that as well. And we're gonna go back to that in a second. But just like the bartenders before him that came from Don's, he continued the lost art of tropical mixology. Again, practice of secret syrups. Uh, through the lean decades of the 80s and 90s when he didn't have to, right? Because this was no longer a thing. Um, Tony's very instrumental in, uh, in my opinion, to the cocktail revival. Because when Jeff Berry was collecting recipes and information for his grog log, Tony shared a lot of secrets with him. He showed him how to make the ice cone for the Navy grog. And, uh, and 
if not for Tony, um, a lot of these things that, uh, that Jeff was able to document would not have been available. They would have been lost to time. Uh, the reason why I put Ciudad in there, we'll go back to that, is in the early 2000s, uh, I want to say like 2002, maybe 2003, I was sitting at the bar with Jeff at uh, the Tiki Tea. Jeff had mentioned to me that Tony was working at Ciudad in Los Angeles. And uh, it was a little Mexican restaurant and he was working the bar making margaritas all day. He'd make like 200 margaritas. And it was basically just making their house drink and they, they had no idea who they had. And he, uh, he still could make you those, those secret Don's drinks because if you went down there, you could order them. As a matter of fact, by continuing that lost art of secret syrups and, and the tropical mixology, the secrecy of that, Tony was mixing syrups out of the trunk of his car. And uh, you could still go down there and get those drinks because he was doing that. He wasn't sharing those recipes with those bartenders. Um, but unfortunately, we don't know what happened to Tony. At one point, he moved to Las Vegas and he was never heard from again. So um, that's how his story ends. And if there's anybody out there that knows more, I'd love to hear it. So that's, uh, that's Tony. We thank him for helping with the cocktail revival and, and preserving some of those secrets. I also wanted to highlight Francis Cabang and the Cabang family. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't post a picture of him and his family because when they opened the Royal Hawaiian in 1947, it really was a family affair. They ran that business as a family. Again, this is the this is the Filipino way, right? The tradition, and um, and they made famous the the lapu lapu. The lapu lapu was their house drink, um, which is shrouded in a little bit of mystery. We're not really sure where the lapu lapu came from. I read some sources that it came from the Luau in Beverly Hills in the fifties. Um, some people say that the first time that it appeared was here at the Royal Hawaiian in, in Laguna Beach. I, I really don't know where the Lapu Lapu came from, but um, they made this their signature cocktail because, again, it's named after a Filipino folk hero, Filipino war hero, Chief Lapu Lapu, who defeated Magellan. And if you go to the Royal Hawaiian today, you can still order that Lapu Lapu. And uh, it's 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 known all throughout the, that, that community. People, Tiki people or not, they know that drink and they love it. Um, this is something that the Kabang family had a hand in making, uh, giving attention to. Now at the bottom here on the bottom left, this is a picture of Francis Kabang Jr. You'll see him also in the top left photo on the far left. Uh, the person in the center of the photo in the top uh, left photo is Francis Kabang Sr. Uh, when Francis Cabang Sr. passed, Francis Cabang Jr. took over the business. And you can see him working a walk here in the bottom left-hand picture at the Royal Hawaiian back in the day. Uh, the Royal Hawaiian was, um, again, Filipino-centric, Filipino family-owned. You can tell by looking at the carvings here, the carvings on the left photo. That's done by Andres Bumatai. Andre Bumatai was also a Filipino immigrant that carved tiki's for, for a lot of the uh, tiki bars and restaurants in the mid-century. And the tiki on the bottom right was carved by Mylan Guanco, who was also a uh, Filipino immigrant. Um, if you look at the photo here on the top right, that's uh, the, the picture that's posted at Francis Cabang Jr.'s obituary. He sadly passed away recently, just in 2019. Uh, so I know we're talking about croc uh, tropical cocktails and, and uh, the Filipino bartenders, but I'd be remiss if I did not also highlight the Filipino influence on the genre as a whole. We have a couple of carvers here that I'd like to give some attention to. Mylan Guanco, for example, is one of them. He was also a immigrant from the Philippines that came to leave his mark in the Filipino, uh, in, the, in the tiki bar world. He carved the tikis that you see at the Contiki in Tucson, who claims to have the record for having the most Mylan Guanco tikis in one spot. 
He also uh, carved the tiki zutter and Sam Seafood, which later became Don the Beachcomber in Huntington Beach. Uh, tiki is at the Tahitian Village, the Tropics Motel in uh, Palm Springs, which is where uh, uh, the reef exists today. The original birth home of Tiki Oasis and the Kapukai in Cucamonga, California, which is Rancho Cucamonga today. What's Mylan Guanco's contribution to the tiki bar world as a Filipino carver? Well, we have mugs that are modeled after his tikis. Uh, the ones on the left, that's a shameless plug of some mugs that I've, I uh, worked on with uh, Tiki Diablo. If you look at the upper left-hand photo, those are three Mylan Guanco carved tikis that resided outside of a reptile shop that held the awning up. Uh, that was at Hobby City in Anaheim. They were removed a few years ago and nobody knows where they went. But as a tribute to Mylan Guanco uh, and, and those, those tikis, and uh, I'm so proud of my, uh, my Filipino heritage and how it, it helped shape the world of tiki, I created a trio with Tiki Diablo. Uh, and Tiki Diablo carved these uh, with those uh, tikis as models. This, this is a Mylan Guanco set that's long been sold, sold out. Um, you can see that there. Uh, as well as on the right, we have tiki's by Gecko, uh, tiki mugs by Gecko. This, this, these are Mylan Guanco tiki's that he made for La Mariano. Gecko is also a, a Filipino uh, a carver. So uh, I found that uh, a bit apropos. And if you look ab above that on the upper right, the Mylan Guanco tiki's that you see there in the Contiki, Tiki Farm has made a, uh, a, a tribute mug to the main one right there in the dining room, if you've ever been there. And I think these mugs are all, these are older mugs, so I don't, I don't know if any of these are still available. I know the ones that I have, that, that I made on the bottom left, they've long been sold out. You might have to find those on eBay. Uh, I think the Tiki one, the Tiki Farm one is also uh, discontinued. I don't know if the Gecko ones are still available. And let's also talk about Andre Bumatai. So Bumatai was another prolific Filipino carver that that uh, decorated a lot of these tiki bars that we enjoy today. Again, the Royal Hawaiian in Laguna Beach, the Tahitian in Beverly Hills, Kelbos, the Royal Tahitian in Ontario, and the Kona Pali in Rosemead. And there's also more. They, they pop up all the time. Bumatai was famous for his particular large bug-eyed style and his contribution to the tiki world. We have uh, mugs by him. The original Bumatai mug came from the Islander. It was also an illustration. It was based on an illustration on their menu, which was based on one of his tikis. And then we have tribute mugs that come from, uh, from Gecko, Tiki Diablo, and Tiki Rob. Uh, also for La Mariana and Latitude 29, which is Jeff Jeff Berry's bar out in uh, New Orleans. So um, really great stuff. And as I mentioned, you know, we have, uh, we're influenced by so many different things, right? Um, you know, Don's staff, they were all mostly uh, Filipinos who would bring in their family members who needed jobs. And so I pose a question to you guys, if you know, how much of an influence do you think that that had on Don? For me, I think that there was very much of an influence. We see these photos of Don sitting at a table covered in banana leaves, and they're having these big uh, feasts. These, you know, these uh, uh, these luau feasts, um, and these are these come from postcards. That's a practice in the Filipino culture called the Budo Fights. Um, it's a culinary experience where copious amounts of food are served tabletop, usually eaten together with friends and family. The term is derived from kit and caboodle. Caboodle is further derived from boodle or booty, a form of a prize. You can see the similarities here. Uh, there was uh, the, the tables covered in banana leaves and then we put all of our food on the center of the table and we eat together. So uh, this is uh, something that actually started, uh, it, originated, it originated in the Philippine Military Academy. 
Um, it was a way for commanding officers to eat together with their army as a symbol of camaraderie, brotherhood, and equality. Um, and you can look this up. You can type in Boodle Fight on Google. You can type in Boodle Fight on, on YouTube. And I can't help but see the similarities to the table that Don is eating at. So uh, I throw that out there. Is that part of the Filipino influence? I don't know. But this is something that originated in the Philipp Philippine Military Academy. So um, it's something that I can't help but notice. Now, I want to talk about Trader Vic for a little bit. Uh, Trader Vic was, he was a competitor to Don. Um, and for those of you that don't know his story, basically Trader Vic was running a little place called Hinky Dinks. It was themed like a trapper lodge. And when he came down to uh, Don the Beachcomber, he uh, was was mesmerized by the environment and the drinks. And he went back to his Hinky Dinks restaurant and uh, turned it into a tropical theme. Instead, changed his name to Trader Vic and started creating tropical cocktails. Um, the legend is that he enjoyed the QB Kula so much when he was at Don's that he tried to reverse engineer it and he came up with the Mai Tai. So um, he's one of the early tiki pioneers as well. As well. Excuse me. And so we look at some of the uh, influence here too. Uh, I, Trainer Vic is largely known for having employed um, Chinese bartenders and which, which the Chinese bartenders and Chinese managers hired other Chinese because they, they were also uh, uh, just like the Filipinos, they, they would hire their own kind. Um, but I can't one, help but wonder how much of an influence there was uh, with the Filipino culture and Trader Vic's. If we look at these menus, the menus, uh, these are very much of, uh, you know, this, in the style of Trader Vic's. And then we look at Filipino folk art they look very similar to me. So, uh, for example, if you go to Salo Salo, it's a Filipino restaurant in West Covina and look at the art on the wall. Uh, same with the Salo Salo in, uh, I think it's in Cerritos. Or you go to Manila Sunset in Rancho Cucamonga. The artwork and the style looks very similar. So, is there an influence as well on Trader Vic's? I'll leave that up to you guys to decide. So now we have... Uh, Don Beach and Trader Vic. And, you know, these guys were competing staunchly with each other. I can't help but see the similarities in the hat, the cigar, the chair. Um, they competed with each other and everybody copied them. So, Kelbos, Contiki Ports, the Kona Kai, the Luau, all over the country, people started uh, building their own Polynesian temples and competed with Don and Vic. And as we know the story today, devolution, uh, 80s and 90s, resurgence, 90s and 2000s, and here we are today. Where can you go today if you want to experience that uh, Don the Beachcomber Lost Art of Mixology, where there's really only two places that have a direct lineage. One of them is the Tiki Tea, because uh, it is run by Ray Buen's son and grandson, Mike and Mike Buen. And Ray was one of Don's original bartenders. A lot of the syrups and recipes were secret to Don and, um, and his bartenders. And a lot of those syrups, uh, the recipes of those syrups, they were never shared anywhere else. So they, they, came, they went with Ray, they came down into his son and grandson and the Tiki, still, tiki Tea still employs the use of a lot of those syrups, syrups today. I think they are using somewhere between 13 and 14 syrups across their various cocktails. I think they have 96 cocktails, some, somewhere around there. And, um, so if you want to experience some of those early drinks like the Bayanihan and, and uh, the Anting Anting and, and some of the early Don's drinks, hit up the Tiki Tea.
And of course, the other place is the Maikai because of uh, Mariano's legacy. So Mariano was one of the bartenders at, at the, uh, again, he started at the Don the Beachcomber in Hollywood, found his way to Chicago and worked for Don's for 16 years before he started the bar program at the Maikai. And the way that they are doing their, the bar program there too is always been the way that it was, right? So those are the only two places that have direct lineage back to the original Don the Beachcomber. And that all comes from, again, the, the two, uh, two of Don's Filipino bartenders. And of course, we continue the tradition here at the Desert Oasis Room. This is a little shot of my Polynesian themed space. So where can you go if you want to learn more? Um, right now, I think the most comprehensive uh, information about the Filipino bartenders that uh, worked for Don's and in general, even the Contiki and, and some of the other uh, uh, tiki spots that we know of from, from uh, the days of Polynesian pop era. Uh, Sip and Safari is a really great read. Jeff Berry has done so much research here and I can't thank him enough for highlighting those heroes of the tiki bar movement. Um, if not for Jeff Berry, we wouldn't have the comprehensive knowledge of not only the drinks, but the stories behind the people that worked at the bar and, and, uh, and that, that Filipino legacy. Of course, it started with the Grog Log. So I, I, would, I would recommend that you get either of those two books if you don't have one or the other, get them both. Um, of course, the Book of Tiki, which we we learn about uh, some more of the legacy of the, the, the uh, Filipino immigrants and their impact on tiki. Um, the, the carvers are in there, uh, Guanco and Bumatai, as well as uh, stories uh, from the Tiki Tea, which also Jeff Berry wrote. So there's more information in there as well. Um, the book, Maikai, uh, History and Mystery of the Iconic Tiki Restaurant by our friend Tim Glasner. Uh, there's information in there from Mariano and a couple of books that don't get a lot of attention. The Adobo Road, which is uh, by Marvin Gapultos. He has a chapter in there about the Filipino bartenders and Filipinos in Hollywood. I, I, I took a little screenshot here of one of the uh, pages inside. They talk about Seven Seas and they also talk about the, the Filipino bartenders uh, back in the early 20th century. So those are a couple of books there that I would recommend you guys pick up. And uh, just some acknowledgements of the sources that I used. Um, every, every person listed here contributed to the knowledge that I have that I shared with you. I stand on the shoulders of those who did the hard work and the interviews and the research before me. And so I wanna make sure that they get, their, uh, get the recognition they deserve. Jeff Berry, Sven Kirsten, um, Mike Buin Sr., if, if you listen to the, the podcast, I've interviewed him a couple of times and he shares a lot of stories. Tim Gleisner again, Marvin Gapult Gapultos. Carolyn Pardia, you might know her as Carolyn on Crack on uh, Instagram. Uh, she is a writer for Los Angeles Magazine and you'll see here a few other links to some resources that, uh, that I used and that you can peruse if you'd like. And um, this is just uh, some of my uh, contact information if you want to stay connected with me. Um, I release a podcast. I try to do it weekly. All this information that I'm sharing with you today, uh, I, I release it in my particular way. That, that, is, that is how I document uh, history of Polynesian pop and tiki. I also do uh, uh, things on YouTube if you'd like to watch our channel. Please subscribe if, if that's the type of thing that you enjoy and, and connect to me on, on uh, social media as well through my Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Polynesian Pop. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to add you on there and, and continue to, uh, to chat with you. So uh, with that said, I'm going to bring it back to our host. <laughs> Adrian, this is amazing. Um, first off, thank you for, for putting the slides together for educating us on you know the Filipino culture in in tiki so I've learned a lot and the food slides that you had at the end made my stomach growl so 
<laughs> um, thank you for putting that in. Um, we do have some questions from our okay. audience members today. So first off, um, what is your favorite cocktail? Ooh, uh, I, that's an easy one for me. I like the raised mistake. And the raised mistake, uh, it's, it's all kinds of things. It's, it's the taste, but it's also the story. And it's also that it's, it, it came from Ray. And when you buy the raised mistake, it supports a family-owned bar. Uh, everything about it is what makes it my favorite drink. So that's an easy, that was an easy one. <laughs> that was an easy one? Okay. <laughs> awesome. Um, who or what inspired you to collect all things Tiki? Uh, you know, I've been asked that before, and the the art spoke to me. Uh, it was something that uh, I, when I was a kid, I just I I remember when I was twelve or thirteen years old, being somewhere that was tropical themed, and saying to my my sisters, "Oh, I want my house to look like this," and they laughed at me. And you know, I thought, "Oh, is that weird?" But you know, it was just, it was the art that really spoke to me. It was the carvings. It was the whole aesthetic. And every time I found something interesting, whether it was a tiki mug or it was like a little Coco Joe's carving or whatever it was, I'd buy it and I'd bring it home and I'd put it on a shelf. And I didn't know that I was collecting. Uh, it wasn't until a few years later that I realized, oh, I, I guess I'm a collector. You know, this was before... <laughs> This was before any book of Tiki or any Tiki Oasis or, or Tiki Central or anything that there was. A, this was like in the early 90s. So um, it was just something that spoke. I didn't I don't know what it was that attracted me to it, but it was just something that I felt a connection to. I hope that answers. Great. The question. Oh, absolutely. Um just out of curiosity, have you counted how many mugs you have in your collection? Yeah, I stopped a couple of years. A couple of years ago, I was at over a thousand. I stopped counting. I, I, oh I don't my need goodness. To, I don't need to know. So, and I don't buy. <laughs> I don't buy everything for the record. So, uh, <laughs> there's just a lot of mugs out there. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's super hard not to not to buy everything that you see because there's just so many great mugs yeah. out there. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, do you know? Are there any Filipino-owned bars open today? There are. So again, I would start with the Tiki Tea, Filipino owned, and they, they go all the way back. The legacy goes all the way back to Don the Beachcomber. Um, but some of the newer ones, uh, we lost one of my favorite ones because of COVID, because of uh, businesses being shut down. It was called Mamsur. Um, and uh, Char Charles Laloya, I think is, is how you pronounce his last name. If you follow him on Instagram, I know he's going to be doing something again. Um, he had a really great craft cocktail bar uh, almost across the street from the Tiki Tea. It was just on the other side of the intersection. Um, but one that's still around is called Jennifer. It's a gin bar in Old Filipino Town in downtown LA. Um, it's owned by three women, all Filipino, all uh, from UCLA. They were, um, it was something that they were passionate about doing. And so they opened a bar there uh, that Die Lovely has performed there before. And, um, and they make great cocktails there. So uh, uh, yeah, if you're ever in LA, Jennifer. Jennifer, yep. We'll have to go visit. Yeah. Um, we have a few more questions. Is there okay. any connection between the poo poo platter and pulutan? Ooh, great question. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> uh, but I, that is something that sounds interesting to research. Uh, I don't know. But that sounds okay. interesting. I'll have to look that up and see what I find. Okay, yeah, we'll be we'll be waiting to to find out the answer. I'll have to research that as well because I'm I'm interested to know. That is a great question. That's a great yeah. question. I love that. Thanks to whoever asked it. Um, another question we have is: Is it true that Trader Vic used to be in disguise at the Don the Beachcomber Bar? I've heard the same. Okay. I've heard the same. I've heard that he would also send in uh, his bartenders, so um, to to watch to watch Don's bartenders make the cocktails. Uh, I I mean I I couldn't tell you for sure because uh, you know <laughs> I'm not from that era. I wasn't there. I don't know anybody that, was. <laughs> so I can't give you a definitive answer from that. But I've heard the same thing. So it's a fun it's a fun rumor. 
I like that rumor. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on claims of cultural appropriation in tiki culture? So I don't think that there's an easy answer to that, but I will say this. Um, is there cultural appropriation? Yes and no. I think it's more complex than having a yes answer or a no answer. I think some things uh, can be offensive and I think some things um, that people are, are calling racially insensitive, um, I don't necessarily agree with. Um, from my particular perspective, you know, based on just this, the information that I presented today, you know, a lot of this tiki culture was started by Filipino immigrants, the bartenders, the carvers, the servers, and the cultural influences, uh, for example, you see in some of those slides that I presented. So it's hard for me to be offended by something that, in my eyes, the immigrants before me helped build. So um, that's, how, that's how I feel. But yeah, are there things that, that I find offensive in other ways? Um, sure. Um, I think that, that that lends to a deeper discussion though. Um, I don't think it's as easy as answering yes or no. Understood, yeah. It's, it's very complex. Sure, um, it's very complex. And yeah, and you're absolutely right. You know, there's not a there's not a yes or no. It's just you know this this history is just not only does it go back very far, but there's just so many different layers that need to yeah. be unpacked. I, I just know that when people say you know when they say to me, well, you should be offended by this, I'll think like, all the bartenders came from where I come from. Should I be offended? I'm 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 proud of their contr contribution to the tropical tropical cocktail tropical cocktail movement um, because without those guys we wouldn't have what we have today and I have a theory I say this all the time um, you know the bartenders are the guys that work behind the bar and make the drinks and they 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 just like the chef is the guy in the kitchen that makes the dishes so I believe a lot of this stuff came from these bartenders, right? Maybe they weren't given the credit that they deserve, but you know, let's think about this. This was in the 1930s when uh, you know we didn't have uh, uh, the same uh, civil freedoms that you know minorities back then were discriminated heavily upon. So they're not going to be getting the same kind of uh, credit that they sh they deserve to get. You know, someone else to take the credit for them. Um, um, and I believe that um, as 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 uh, not good feeling as that is to say. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another question we have is, how do you see Tiki going forward in these times of keeping ourselves isolated as Tiki is a real community and a friendship thing? Wow, it's a great question. Uh, I think that with with COVID affecting how businesses can operate day to day, um, this, this uh, complex issue of cultural appropriation in addition to uh, devolution, plain and simple, uh, I think Tiki is facing something that it's never faced in the past. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Um, I will say that uh, history seems to be repeating itself in the form of, you know, devolved, devolved things. That's what killed Tiki the first time around. Um, I'd hate to see history repeat itself. Um, so I don't know. I think that that's, um, that's a question that I'd have to think about a little bit more deeply. Um, I do think that um, if, if people uh, embrace appreciation versus appropriation, which again, can be a very fine line. Um, I think that that's, that's something that could keep, uh, that could keep the subculture alive. And, and appreciation can come in the form of many ways. Um, it could come in the form of supporting small businesses when they need it most. Um, so, you know, um, that's another complex question that I'd have to give a little bit more thought to. 
Yeah, our audience members are asking amazing questions. Yeah, yeah these are um, great questions. <laughs> deep, deep, deep. We, yeah, we have two more. Um, oh. One, is there a comprehensive list of all the Filipino created cocktails? Uh, I don't think that there is one that exists, uh, but maybe I'll put that together and see what I can find out. Um, again, as I mentioned uh, a couple of questions ago, I don't think that they got all the credit for the things that they should have gotten credit from. Um, and so we'll never know if there's things missing from that list or if there are things that, you know, that exist that we just don't know about. Um, but I don't think there's a comprehensive list at this point. Um, I'll see if I can put one together. Um, That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. And our final question for today is, is the building where the original Christian's hut still there? Uh, it is. And I, oh, if, if we're, we're talking about the building in Catalina Island, I don't believe it is. Um, the one in Newport Beach, it is. And I can't remember what it is today, uh, but it does exist. Uh, but maybe what I'll do is I'm going to, I'll look up the address and I will go down there and I'll, maybe I'll do like a short video and put it up on my YouTube. And we'll, we'll see what's there. That might be a fun thing to go explore. So, yeah. Yeah. but the original one uh, that was in Catalina Island was on the Isthmus and it was, from what I understand, was just a temporary spot. So I don't think it's there anymore, but that might be another one, another fun one to explore as well. So, so we'll see, I'll, I'll do some research and maybe I'll bring my video camera with me and, and, uh, and we'll do some urban archaeology. Oh, that would be so fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, Adrian, thank you again, you know, for, for putting the presentation together, for answering all of our questions. And thank you to Miss Di Lovely for, you know, introducing Adrian and for being with us here today. For those that joined the conversation today, please consider a donation directly to the Desert Oasis Room. You can make the donation at desertoasisroom.com slash donate. We hope that you will join us next month on the second Sunday of the month at 11 a.m. Pacific as we celebrate Black History Month. If you're interested in joining Tiki Oasis Diversity and Inclusion Council or have an idea for a future topic, please send us an email at info at tikioasis.com. Until next month. Bye, everyone.